kickoff starts now. Um, when you when you guys were forty point underdogs against the team from Texas, do you remember any of the players that played for that team? Did any of them end up going to play D one? Did any of them even make the the pros? Yeah, you know the team we played against. You know, and I can't remember most of their names. Uh, I, I do a pretty good job of analyzing the guys as players, and my I have assistant coaches that do a great job at that time of knowing the guys and everything about them, their shoe size, and we try and find out weaknesses just like everybody else does. And for a bowl game, you got three and a half weeks of preparation. You know, so you know there's plenty of time to do that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. but I, I kind of I'm a, I'm a blinder guy, and and my job was to convince. We we, we were throwing the ball. 35, 36 times a game. And we had the best pass receiving, uh, quarterback uh, receiving combination in the country. And, uh, and, and again, we're non-scholarship and we were real proud of that. Uh, and we went against a team that was a 4-2-5 defense and their five DBs were going to, if I, if I can remember, Miami, Florida State, Texas, LSU. Uh, I can't remember where the fifth one. I mean, that, that, but that's the kind of players a full scholarship school is going to get. I yeah. called one of my buddies that uh, was the running back coach at the University of Miami in Florida, and I called him up and I said, Donnie, you know, we're, we're playing Kilgore. What's it going to be like? And he said, ah, it's one of my prime recruiting areas. You know, they'll get 25, 30 players a year go D1. Wow. Now, you think, you, know, you think about that, and they can only start 22. So that means they've got backup players. That are, but, but, again, that's what happens at a, a full scholarship JUCO. They can get that kind of talent. Yeah. And playing a state like Texas that has such – amazing high school football uh uh so uh you know i and i don't remember their names but i remember we had uh, we ended up with eight kids that went d1 and they had 25 and so uh you could see the talent difference but we had a lot of smart kids we had a lot of kids from my old high school uh and sabino that i had recruited that that were that that tweener type of kid that just didn't quite make it to d1 but wanted their shot and it, it, it by that time we were uh uh, we, we, we were we were a competitive JUCO, even though we were not scholarship in the, in the national NJCAA. We were a, a competitive team. Uh, our opening game, somehow, we had only freshmen. I think we had two sophomores, and we and the rest of the team was freshmen. And they gave us the defending national champion in opening mm-hmm. game, and we beat them. Wow! And we, and we didn't beat them by out footballing them. We beat them by being more patient. We didn't turn the ball over once. We had close to 300 yards rushing. Wow. Uh, they helped us out by dropping. You know, they probably didn't take us all that seriously. And why would they? We're a first-year team playing our first game ever. And they're the defending national champions. And we had them at home. We had a sellout crowd. They closed the stadium uh, 30 minutes before kickoff. It was that full. And uh, our kids came out and played the way you'd want them to play. We played mistake-free football. And you get that. And, and we had to do the same thing in the bowl game. You know, we were so out-talented. I had to call in my, my, my battery, my quarterback and, and receivers, and I had to convince them that we stood no chance, you know, if we, if we threw the ball the way we normally did. And these, these guys are looking, this is my shot on national television. And, and, but, you know, you have to, when you recruit your players and, and when you build your team, you got to convince them uh, that, you know, part of being on the team, come on, we, threw, we had games where we threw the ball 45 times. You know, don't tell me you haven't had your chances. You know, look at the films. You trust me as a coach. You know, here's the strategy. I told them if we throw the ball more than 22 times, we lose the game. Yeah. We won the game on the 22nd throw. Now, that is that is not skill. I got to tell you straight wow. up. That, that's pure luck. That is pure luck you know, to guess at that close. But that, in fact, that's exactly what happened. Our tailback was the MVP of the game. He had 176 yards rushing. And, and we were going against a, a team where every single player on their defense was a Division I player. Matter of fact, they had the uh, runner-up for division uh, for the uh, National Defensive Player of the Year. They had the runner-up as a defensive end. We, our outside linebacker, uh, Mickey Pimentel, ended up the National Defensive Player of the Year based in large part on his performance on that game. You know, so, uh, uh, it, it, it was, you, you know, I say, it, it, it's people – have no idea behind the scenes what it takes to put it together, you know, to say, uh, you know, this is what we have to do. And if we get to this point, then we go in this direction, if we go in that direction. And I, and I, I, I guaranteed that, that the quarterback and the receivers that the last drive would be theirs. You know, we just have to, everybody, we got to hang in the game. We got to keep the clock running. We got to shorten. You know, I, I think 
by, by the strategy we ran, for example, in a college football game, you know, where it's full 60 minutes, unlike 48 at high school, I think we denied them about 15, 16 plays by keeping the clock going. Does that make sense? And yeah. that, kept our, that kept our defense from getting really, really beat up. And, and which they were, by the way. And, and they were in the fourth quarter, they were hanging on by threads. But, but I tell you what, when we took the lead and we needed a defensive stand, you, you'd have thought every one of our players was NFL bound. That's how they upped their level of game. And that's, that, and that's what you want. That's what you do your offseason conditioning for. That's why you run all the gassers. That's why you do all that. So when the moment's at hand and you're still in the game, you know, you've, got, you've got the physical wherewithal to compete to win. And again, that's that's it goes back to that saying that I drill in my players over and over. To win the big game, you got to be in the big game. And to win the big game in the fourth quarter, you got to be in the big game in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. and, and you you teach that philosophy and you and you strategize for that philosophy. And at the same time, you got to get input from your players because you know you want them to be happy and and feel fulfilled that they're getting their chance too. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. So in the NFL right now, just going to the pros there's some teams that throw the ball a crazy amount. And you could say 30, 40 years ago, it was almost, it was a lot more running the ball, playing hard-nosed defense. And now the NFL's turned into more of a passing league. If you were an NFL coach, what would your philosophy be? Would you try to adapt to the times and throw the ball 40, 45 times a game? Or would you try to run the ball, go off of play action and play good defense? Well, first, the running game is coming back to the NFL, and you're seeing a reemergence of the running back as a as a key player. Where for, for up until last year or two years, it really started two years ago, and you're seeing teams that are they're bringing themselves back into the into the right. league That's by being true. under center. There's even talk of the fullback position coming back at least part time. You know, people want to see offense. There's no there's no question about that. They don't want to see a seven three game. You know, you can get away with that if you win. But, uh, boy, if, if you lose, you know, or even if you're losing close, that, that's a toughie. Uh, people want to see offense. That's just the way it is now. And I don't blame them. But, uh, but you're seeing a return to the running game. For me, it's a matter of what my talent is available. It's not what I like. It's what can we do successfully. That, that's always been my philosophy as a coach. What, what can we do as a team that's going to make us look, you know, on the field? You know, what, what, can we, what can we execute? And then – specific game plan what can we execute against that specific defense yeah. and that's why you have to have you, you you don't go into a game with with a game plan you go into a game with multiple game plans because well what happens if your quarterback gets hurt which we've all had if you've coached long enough that happens what happens if you know if, if your running back breaks his leg and in, in, in the middle of the fourth quarter come back what do you do then you you, you just can't give up that, that's, that's a message that you can, as a coach, you can never recover from because remember a lot of those players you're going to have for the rest of the season or for next year, right? And they want to know that you have confidence in them too. So, you know, you develop an attitude of, hey, next man up. You know, that, that, you know that's something that you have to build. You can say it, but you got to demonstrate that and you got to demonstrate that in front of their players all the time during the games. And, uh, and, and so I like to build my team around what, what the skills are of what we have, you know, not what do you say you are, you know, what, what do you do? Look at, look at all behavior. Stop, stop. You could, you could say, you know, all people that are listening out there, they could save themselves a real lifestyle kick in the butt by not listening to what people say, but by judging them by the sum of their actions. And if you do that, you end up with a chance to see what the person is really like. You know, because we all, you know, come on, let, a lot of people can talk a good game. Some people don't talk at all and you don't know anything about them. You know, I, as one of the things I talk about in my book is the, is the, uh, uh, the part that a lot of people like is the pregame in the locker room before the big game and watching the different players and how they handle you know, pregame in the locker room. You, know, you got guys that are pacing back and forth in the room. You got other guys that have their headsets on. They're laying down, their heads in their locker. They, they got a towel over their eyes. They don't want to see. They don't want to hear. They want to be into themselves. You got some guys that are social bunnies that want to talk to other people. You know, and you have to set up an atmosphere where everybody can be there, be themselves and be comfortable because one of the things you want as a head coach, you don't want pregame distractions. And so you want everybody to be comfortable in their own skin. And how do you set that up? You know, a boom box doesn't do that because you got a lot of kids that don't want, they don't want that level of noise, mm -hmm. you know, so headsets have been a great, <laughs> that's been a great thing, you know, to, to, so that everybody can be their own person. And, and so you, you know, 
you know, when you look at a team, when you decide what offense you're going to run, you know, whether you're going to pass, but look at what you got and what can you can get, what can you get, you know, yeah. and, and, and are you going to trade this player away? He's been in town for 12 years. He's the heart of the community. You know, there, there's NFL teams that, that aren't going to let that guy go no matter what. And there's other NFL teams that go, he's a player. He doesn't fit our schemes. So he's a great guy. Too bad he's gone and we'll get him someplace else. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you see that all the time. Uh, who'd have ever thought? Who'd have ever thought that it'll let Tom Brady go? You know, uh, uh, I would have thought he would have been lived and died a Patriot. But you know what? It changed, and yeah. and, and that's just life. And and again, you know, I can guarantee you that that both. It's no accident that New England was winning all that, and it's not just Belichick, and it's not just Brady. It's the two of them. And it was the offensive coordinator and some of the receivers and a bunch of other people buying into that system. You know, there's a whole lot of people that made that together. But I'm willing to bet that Brady is going to be – he's going to be successful, maybe maybe on the – maybe or maybe not on the same level. Belichick's going to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can see the short, this shortened NFL season. Which team is – it has – so far has the most amount of players that have opted out? The Patriots. It's, it's the Patriots. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to think past the season to the future, okay? Yeah. And who is that going to benefit the most? The Patriots. They're going to get because they're wrong pick. They're going to get draft picks. Uh -huh. They're going to have West rested players. They're going to have the confidence of their players that have stayed with them that know that, hey, these guys, they, these guys didn't blink when I said, I'm taking care of my family first. These yeah. guys had my back, paid me my money, said, hey, great, take a year off. We, we understand, right? And, yeah. uh, and, and that's just, and I mean, no one knows exactly how that's going to turn, turn out. Right. But I think it's a heck of a good strategy. I mean, to me, if I was one of those players that didn't feel comfortable and knew that team had my back, they'd, they'd have me. They'd have me, you know? And they'd have my wife and my family too, right? Right. And th those things, you can't put a price tag on those things. You know, you get to the NFL, and it's the same in high school and college, but a lot of times games are lost on the bus. A lot of times games are lost in the locker room before they ever get on the field. And, and again, the fans don't see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what's so great about the Patriots, what makes them so great is obviously they have a great coach, a great quarterback, but the reason they're so successful all the time is the culture that Belichick has built. Mm -hmm. It's a winning culture. When you go in there, you win games. And right now, next season, their team is not that skilled anymore. It's an right. average skilled team, but you can never count the Patriots out because they just have a winning – they're they're just winners. And either either they're going to win a bunch of games, contend for the playoffs, or they're going to completely tank, get the first overall pick, mm -hmm. draft the greatest quarterback ever, and then they'll be set for the next 20 years. Yeah. I yeah. I, I, I'd say I don't think that their success was an accident at all. Uh, I think it took a lot of things. You know, you look at Belichick, and he, and he wasn't all that successful – you know, in the different teams and, and now he's successful. Well, it's like say it's at the beginning, it's it's that the very thing first question you asked me, my answer was about you gotta change the culture, remember? And, yeah. and and that's and now you see the Patriots have that culture. And that's not gonna go on away in a year, particularly in this particular year, with all these strange things and goings ons and partial playings. And I, I don't think there's anybody in the NFL that doesn't look at the Patriots and seeing these guys not playing and isn't thinking. You know, old Bill's got another strategy he's about to deploy here, yeah. right? A, a very unique strategy, yes, that's for sure. But, hey, he's a pretty unique kind of guy. Remember, you know, before Belichick, everybody used to wear a, a, pretty much a coat and tie on the, on the sidelines. You know, maybe <laughs> you get away with a polo shirt. Now it looks like they're out in football practice, right? Yeah. You, know, you look at most coaches and it looks like they're, they're gardening in their yard or something, you know? And... <laughs> Yeah, so he's he's changed a lot without without forcing the change, just by you know, just by being create creative. And yeah, you know, and and did they fudge, you know, a little bit here and there? Do they push limits? And yes, but you know, when you really look at it up close and personal, there, there's a lot of people in the organization that want to be part of that and think of that 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 take the reins in their own hands. You know, one of the funniest things that that the the, the flight gate with the footballs. You know, I could tell you that that. I've been in this profession 48 years, and I can tell you the last 45, I never inflated a football. <laughs> Once I got out of that, you know, that, that, that scene where there was like three coaches and we all did it, I used to line the fields too in high school, you know, but 
You know, I haven't done that in a long time. I haven't, I haven't inflated a football in a long, long time. You know, yeah. my quarterback gets together with the equipment manager and they figure it out and I don't care. You know, if the referee checks the ball before the game, if he says it needs more air, it needs more air. I can guarantee you and all that deflate gate. You know, what people forget is before that ball got reported, you know, mm -hmm. that some referee had that ball in his hands for, for more than half a game, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, you got to think about that when you say, well, they pulled the fast one. Well, a referee, that, since a new ball goes in on every single play, just about, that, uh, that ball was in some referee's hands before it got on the field, and he allowed it to go out there, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. Anyway, it, it's just, uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I don't have to be in love with the guy's personality either to want him on my team to play for him. That's another thing in a sport like football. You're not, you're going to, you, you know, I always tell coaches, be, be a human being first. And that means some of the players you're going to like, some of the coaches you're going to like more than others. That's not the big factor. You know, it's, it'd be great if you liked them all, but that's pretty tough in life, you know. And particularly when you get in an organization, you know, you at practice, there's at Division One, you got a, over 100 players out there. You know, counting your ancillary staff on a football field at a Division One practice, there's 160 to 180 people out there, not counting people watching, uh, reporters, uh, live TV cameras all the time, you know, and, and you're wondering more and more why, you know, colleges don't allow that. Well, somebody gets fired for dropping an F-bomb at practice, right? Because it gets on national television. So what's the easiest way to handle that? Change my personality or not let a TV reporter, you know, <coughs> onto, onto my practice field, you know? Right, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, again, again, you want your players to be comfortable too. It's not just about you as the coach. Yeah, yeah sometimes I feel like, the fans don't humanize the players. Like in the NFL, there were players who were opting out this year. And instead of the fans supporting them, some of the fans said, you shouldn't be opting out. And I, it's, you sometimes need to humanize the players and treat them well. And especially if you have a coach who doesn't humanize the players and who doesn't connect with the player. Let, let me tell you something. Working with, uh, with, a big major college NFL and even with the Olympic committee, world-class athletes and other sports. One of the hallmarks of all those highly successful people is we don't pay attention to what the fans think or say. They're mm -hmm. fans. They pay their mission. You know, they, they tune on their TV, which generates the income for, for the big time contracts like that. You know, the fans get the, that, and, you know, as long as they don't break certain rules, throw stuff and insult yeah. your family. Th you think, you know, but fans want to, that's what that's what fans do that's what they're there for we, we, it certainly wouldn't be the major sport it is without fans and and so you, you know an athlete's job is to do their job you know if you're paying attention to what the fans are saying you're probably not achieving anywhere close to what you should as a player or a coach and so you know what i get that and you know would it be nice if they were nicer yeah but you know they pay their money and that's what they get to do you know uh-huh yeah. um Making a basketball analogy here, are you familiar with uh, the coaches John Wood and Bobby Knight? Of course. I, matter of fact, yeah. my, one of my uh, – uh, you, you couldn't have mentioned – for, for, for your analogy, you couldn't yeah. have mentioned two, uh, two better things because uh, I, I did a Nike clinic with John Wooden. And oh, wow. I don't know how a friend of – you know, that went to USC, one of my former players, told him about me, and he snuck into the back of the room unbeknownst to me. It was an all-sports clinic and uh in california and he snuck into the back of the room and he heard my speech and afterwards he came up to me and gave me a hand signed uh, picture of him with his pyramid of success wow. and told me that you know you're going to be famous someday and I, I'll, I'll i'll never forget that and as a real young coach i got to spend three days with coach knight and wow. uh at practice and watching what he did and i could i could write a book about my three i should my three days with bobby knight and it was uh and it, i was just an outsider watching but the, the guy you know the guy is a, a different sort but let me tell you when it comes to coaching the guy the man was a genius i mean it's i, I my my i'm not like him at all i don't want to be like him uh i don't like some of the things that he's done uh but you know what that's when it comes to but you have to be able to, to divorce yourself from that because he's him and i'm me and i can't be him and i tell this to young coaches all the time you know i want to be like you and i go no 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 don't try and be like me you know so anyway go on go ahead with your thing but i just cool. wanted to tell you i did you, you picked two perfect guys for me i'm glad uh and i think you pretty much answered it there because if you enjoyed this episode of from the den Please remember to subscribe, comment, and like this video.
Or, if you're a Packers fan, remember to dislike and leave a nasty comment. Click the links on the screen to access additional content.